So today, I get to introduce you to one of my all-time favorite people in the world. If you're a visitor here, I'm, I'm Len Billings, I'm the senior pastor here, but you won't be hearing me speak today. You'll be hearing me next Sunday, so please come back. But we met, Connie and I, my Connie, his wife's, this man's name is Connie as well, but wife's name is Connie as well, but um, Jim, we met Jim Walters back in uh, October of 1990. We were involved in a church plant in, in Garland, Texas, and Jim was the mission pastor at Cassaview Baptist Church. Well, we did not know that God was bringing together a friendship that would span nearly 30 years, and I'm sure it'll go beyond that. Um, when we felt God's call to move up, back up to Colorado to start a church down in the Highlands Ranch area, Jim, a former uh, fighter pilot, drove us up here, not in a jet, which we really wanted, but, <laughs> and he, he drove us up, and we, we flew over the Highlands Ranch area, and and got a bird's eye view and did some some core group meetings and and Jim was instrumental in that and Jim Jim has just been an encourager and a coach and and just an incredible friend to me for many many years and and I'm excited that we get to hear from him today so would you please welcome with me Jim Walters thank you Lynn I appreciate your generous introduction I enjoyed it. If my mother were here, she would have believed all of that. But it's okay. Well, you are, this is a great looking congregation. I have to tell you, it, the extra hour of sleep probably brought a few more smiling faces in, didn't it? But a lot of churches today long to be multi-generational churches. I think you've got it down. I see a bunch of kids and young adults, and I see wisdom people everywhere, which is good. <laughs> and you are a singing church. Uh, we, since we retired from Bear Valley Engine, we visited a number of different churches, not to be critical, but some of the really big churches have these great bands, but no one sings. And I think worship, I think the band is up here to be cheerleaders, and the worship team is out here. And it was great to hear the voices rolling over me as I sang there. So I congratulate you. In fact, I congratulate you for showing up at church on a Sunday in Colorado. <laughs> Only about one-tenth of the population of the Denver metro area are actually in a church building this morning. So you're in the top ten uh, just by showing up. But you proclaim something when you come in these doors and publicly worship the name of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're here checking this out as a visitor. That's okay. But all around you are people who are proclaiming today that we belong to him and he belongs to us. And that isn't going to change no matter what happens on Tuesday or the weeks after or the months after or the years to come. We belong to him and he belongs to us and we are going to proclaim that. Amen? Well, another way that you actually proclaim that, in addition to coming to church, is how you handle your money. Because the truth of the matter is, believers have a different perspective on money. We have a different relationship to it. We have different uses for it. We have different values about it. And so Lynn said, we're going to do a series. And I said, oh, I'd like to be the opening guy in this series. Uh, about We're calling it Master Your Money, right? It's either your servant or your master. Really, what I came to say to you today is money makes a great servant or a terrible master. And the choice is going to be yours. Now, being a substitute teacher today, well, I have to tell you, I feel like my IQ has gone up 10 points just being in the shadow of School of Minds already today. <laughs> this looks like a brainy congregation. So I thought it'd be fun rather than have a lecture. You get plenty of lectures. Let's have a quiz, okay? Yeah. So I'm going to put the questions on the screen and see what you know about money. And then I'm going to have you shout out the answers that are mostly true or false. And you can go ahead and take a risk and shout it out. And if you're wrong, we won't grade the papers. We'll just have a good laugh at you. No, <laughs> we won't laugh at you. But, we're going to, but I'll tell you what, money's a tough topic. Most pastors don't like talking about money, do they? Did you know that Jesus talked about money more than any other single topic that he talked about? I think he understood what a challenge it was going to be for every generation, every century, every culture. It's just a really important part of life. I wouldn't say that money is as important as oxygen, but it's pretty close right behind there, right? And money has power, and money talks. Yes, it does. When my money talks, mostly it says, goodbye, I'm leaving now, <laughs> so I have to manage it. But let's, uh, let's see if we, what's what, I want to see what you know about money. So here we go. First question, number one, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Is that true or false? false. Right. 
Okay, next slide. The real answer is, the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And a very curious thing about this verse in Timothy is there are three or four Greek words that we normally think of as love. If you know any Greek at all, you know agape. It's a great Greek word. Agape love is unconditional love. That's not the word here. Phileo, like Philadelphia. Delphos means brother. Phileos means love, the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, really the city of cheesesteaks. That's what it translates as. <laughs> but it's not the word here. Eros is a Greek word from which we get erotic. It's not the word here. No. It's a very, I have to look at it, it's a very strange word. It's, it's pronounced philagoria, and it really doesn't mean love. It means the craving for, the endless appetite for. It's really more close to lust. Because you see, money is not immoral in itself. Money is amoral. It's neutral. It's all in how we use it. It's like electricity. You can use electricity for light. You can use electricity to drive a car, or you can use electricity to shock somebody. It's good or bad, all depending on how you use it. In fact, cars are that way, aren't they? Cars can be really used. How many of us drove a car to church this morning? Cars can be bad if you text and drive and crash into somebody. Guns are great controversy. Are guns good or bad? Well, it depends. In the hand of soldiers and the police officers, they can be good. In the hands of the wrong people, they can be bad, can't they? It's all in how you use these things that makes them good or bad. Okay, let's try another one. Question number two. According to Scripture, a person cannot one and at the same time serve both God and money. You recognize it, don't you? It's from Matthew. Here it is, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says this, No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, be devoted to one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the New Testament's written in Greek. You know that? Except for a few places, the word appeared in Aramaic. And wherever the word was in Aramaic, the early translators thought, well, why is it in Aramaic? It's not in Greek. Aramaic is the form of Hebrew spoken in Jesus' day. Something like the difference in the King James English and modern Ebonics. They're both English, but they're really different, aren't they? Okay, so Aramaic, when the words were in Aramaic, they felt like there was a reason. They didn't translate them. I think of when Jesus told the little girl, Arise, in the text, it's in English, it'll say, Jesus said, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. But here, the word mammon. Now, mammon, very similar to this philagoria idea. Mammon is this unquenchable greed and quest for more. And that is the definition of what it means to serve money, to never have enough. I think of Howard Hughes, who was a famous aviator in my day and invented airplanes and, and ran TWA for a while. And was before there was uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, Howard Hughes was maybe the richest man walking around on earth. And there's a great illustration in the last week of his life. He was in a hospital bed hooked up to IVs, and he had special TV monitors brought into the hospital room so he could monitor the progress of all the stocks he owned to see if they were going up and down. And he died. And people have often wondered, how much did he leave behind? I can tell you how much he left behind. All of it. <laughs> Every last penny. I've done a lot of funerals in my time. I ride up in the shotgun seat in that lead car going through the cemetery. You look back at that long line of cars. I've never seen an armored car back there in that procession or a U-Haul trailer. When you're gone, you leave it all. You can't take it with you. You can send it on ahead, but you can't take it with you. So there it is. We've got to stay away from that kind of stuff. Let's try a third question, a little harder. Any person who lives righteously in Christ can expect to always have financial prosperity. Ah, I hear sneering. Excellent. Now, if, you're, if you can't sleep this morning at 1 a.m., turn your TV on, and you'll find preachers that will tell you that's true. In fact, if you can't sleep at night and put the TV on the Christian channels, it's a freak show out there at 1 a.m., so don't do it. Um, if you were to talk to Christians in any other culture outside of America, they would tell you how absurd the idea of prosperity theology is. In truth, to be honest with you, there is a sense that if you live righteously in Christ, you typically, over the long period of time, will experience some upward mobility. The drunk that sobers up, the sloth that cleans up and goes to work, the person that disciples himself and learns, typically will do better. We, we have seen that since the American Revolutionary days until today. The people that are the followers of Christ and the Bible and live a moral and clean life tend to do better. Okay, But that does not mean that you'll always have phosphorus financial prosperity. But what if we change that last word to contentment? Would that be true? Would you buy this? 
Any person who lives righteously in Christ can expect to have financial contentment. All right, it's in Philippians 4 and 12. Let me show you that. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And he wrote this, by the way, from a jail cell. I have learned the secret. Would you like to know what the secret is? It's in the next verse. Actually, I don't have it on a slide. What does the next verse say? I can do through... There it is. Now, I call this contentment theology. How many have ever heard of contentment theology? That's so sad. I made it up, so no one's ever heard of it. No. Um, actually, what, there, is a, there is a theology called um, provisional theology. That's, uh, the official word is provisional. You can find that in the books. That Provisional theology says God will provide your needs according to his glory in Christ. And that's a promise, isn't it? A biblical promise is usually a statement that has a condition and a blessing. My God will supply all of your needs according to his glory Where's the condition in there? It's in the last two words. In Christ. A prepositional phrase my English teacher taught me. And that is the most important prepositional phrase in the Bible. You will find it everywhere. To be in Christ. It's as if all the blessings of God have been bottlenecked in Christ. But it is the biggest bottleneck you have ever imagined. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory for those who are in Christ. Amen. Okay? Good stuff. Uh, the, the, this is one of the indicators, by the way, contentment, that, you, that money is your servant, that you have mastered the idea of money management, is that you can be content. Now, I will tell you what, we've had a long, uh, Connie and I, wife is here today, uh, 38 years together, and uh, we, we've been poor, broke, I wouldn't say we've ever been poor. I think poor is a state of mind. Broke is an empty pocket, okay? Not having any money in your pocket, yeah. And we've been well off. You know, Well off is better, by the way. Uh, broke is an inconvenience. It's not a sin to be poor. It's just an inconvenience, isn't it? But we have been content at both ends of that spectrum, knowing that our source is God and that money is our servant. We don't serve it, okay? Fourth question, here we go. The concept of stewardship which is a word we never use outside the church, so I don't use it anymore, Lee, and I changed it to biblical money management because we like to talk about money management. Everybody talks about it. Everybody has a money manager. Everybody has a financial plan. Do you have a financial plan? If you don't, your plan is called the no plan plan. Yeah, you have the no plan plan. Okay, everybody has a manager. Everybody does management. So here it is. The concept is built around this principle that we actually do not own our possessions true. Is that, that's not so strange to you? Good. Let me show you to you in Psalm 50. Psalm 50 is a beautiful, powerful psalm. Here, the, just reading from the middle of the psalm, God said, I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, and the hills are his too. I know every bird in the mountains, and the insects in the fields have their purposes, don't they? We know that now. And if I were hungry, I wouldn't bother to tell you, because the world is mine and all that isn't it. How do you spell all? A-L-L. What does all mean? All means all, and that's all that all means. There's some great teaching in this slide, by the way. One of the great theological truths here is this. God does not need your bull. <laughs> and you can take that any way you want to take it, and it'll be true. He doesn't need your bull. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Suppose that you're an unhappy retail customer and you throw the door open at some store and you go in there and bang on the counter and say, I want to see the owner of the store. I've been ripped off and I'm not happy. I want to see the owner of this store. Some guy comes out of the back all upset. Sir, sir, how can I help you? I'm the manager here. How can I help you? When he says the words, I am the manager, what is he really saying? I'm not the owner. Because the owner would have come out there and said, this is my store. How can I help you? So the question for you is, if there's a money issue, are you going to say, this is my money? Or are you going to say, I'm just the manager here. And I'm managing a certain amount of money, large or small, for God who actually owns it. You get this point, you can sleep the rest of the sermon. Because it will make every decision about money easier, 
and better. It's God's money. I'm just managing it. You know, I have a Toyota Camry. And one day, the alternator died. And I had to pray. I said, Lord, your Camry <laughs> needs an alternator. <laughs> How exactly do you plan to pay for this thing, you know? <laughs> this is your problem. Because it's your Camry, right? That's right. I remember the first time I was going to go on a mission trip, long before I met, I was a new Christian, and I was sitting in a church like this at a meeting, and God just impressed upon me, I'm supposed to go on this group to El Salvador. And I'm praying, Lord, I don't, I don't have the money. It was a lot of money to go on these mission trips. And God said, I have it, <clears throat> I have it, and I have it in your savings account. I'm making a withdrawal. I said, that's right. I did say that it was all yours. Everything I have is yours, and if you want it, you can have it. And I emptied the savings account and went on a mission trip. And God filled the savings account up again and again and again and again. I'm giving with a spoon, and God is giving back with a shovel. Spending decisions get easier. Would God want me to pay the rent and the electricity with his money? Absolutely. Would God want me to feed my children and provide medical uh, care for them? And, and, and I have an adopted son in, in Africa, and he had a medical need. You bet. God's money is going to go right over there. Western Union, at the speed of light, we're going to solve that problem. Would God want me to take my family on a vacation sometimes? Yeah. It's called Sabbath. Does God want me to have a decent car that will get me from where I live in Millican to Golden without a lot of stress? Yes. Would God want me to play the lottery with his money? Maybe not. I'm not going to say that the lottery is a sin, because I can't find that in here. I don't think it's wise. Actually, I think the lottery is just a tax on people who did not do well in math class. Okay? You get this point, though. You get this right here. You got the whole thing. All right, next quiz. Next question. As managers, now that I've sold you that we're all managers, it's a good thing to work and to earn money and to support our needs, right? Is that true? Or is work a part of the curse? No. Adam and Eve worked in the garden before the curse, didn't they? The, the curse that came upon mankind that hadn't been lifted yet was that work became hard. Agricultural work became hard. Yard work. I'm convinced yard work is part of the Adamic curse upon mankind. I hate yard work. <laughs> And last time I checked, childbirth was still very painful, right? But let me tell you, how many of you love the job? If you have a job and love your job, raise your hand. If you don't love your job, start looking for a different job. Because jobs are holy and sacred. And you don't have to work to a church to have a holy and sacred job. Wherever you are, your work matters to God. If you're not sure of that, I'll give you a couple books. One's called The Monk and the Merchant. Very easy title, Monk and Merchant. You can see the pieces of the book right away, can't you? The monk is a religious worker. The merchant's a businessman. Both of them count to God. Or Brother Lawrence, classic, very short book, Practicing the Presence of God. Brother Lawrence was a kitchen monk in the Middle Ages. He didn't get to leave the services or ring the bells. He washed dishes all day long. He called himself Lord of all pots and pans. <laughs> but in the book, he teaches us that washing dishes can be as sacred as any other thing that we do. Yes. In fact, if you, if you don't think work is a blessing, talk to somebody who's looking for work. They'll tell you what a blessing it is. You know, I, I think that uh, John 10.10 10 is a great verse here. Uh, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. I, I, don't have the the I don't have poverty theology. I don't think that God is poor, the church is not poor. He doesn't want us to be poor. If we're all poor and, all, and, and eating out of dumpsters, we can't do missions around the world. We have to have the resources to be able to give the resources away to make the difference. It is the plan of God all the way through. In fact, that same verse, 1 Timothy 6, 17, that talked about the love of money being the root of all evil, it goes on to say God gave us all things to enjoy. Okay? Next question. Next question says, God promises... Oh, we, we'll, we'll skip that one. Here we go. God promises special blessings to those who give, and specifically to those who tithe to Him. If you're not familiar with the word tithe... It actually means to give not just 10%, but the first 10%. It's a first fruit kind of offering. God prom does God promise special blessings to those who tithe? Actually, he does. Malachi 3 and, and 10, the next verse here, is a, a very, very much a Bible promise. You have the condition and the benefit. Uh, is that new to y'all? You know a, a, a promise is a, a literary genre, a type of statement. Like, you know what a proverb is, right? A proverb is a short, self-evident wisdom statement. You know it when you see it. A psalm, you know what that is? It's a, basically lyrics to a song. A beatitude, 
a statement of blessing upon people who are in a certain attitude. And all Bible promises have conditions and benefits, right? If my people who are called by my name, there's the first condition, will do some things, will what? Humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, then I will hear and I will heal them. If you'll do it, I'll do it. But if you ever find yourself praying, oh Lord, if you'll just give me that new job, I'll start tithing. You got it backwards. Don't put the ifs on God. He puts the ifs on us. Just meet the conditions. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from how much of our unrighteousness? How does all, what does all mean? All means all, and that's all that all means. How about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. Where's the condition in that promise? Oh, it's in there. Oh, yeah. Whoever believes in him. Sometimes there's not a condition. Sometimes it's just there. Boom. It's called a sovereign promise. But these are promises, okay? Test me in this. One of the few times God says, try me out. Check me out. By the way, have you not experienced God in a while? If you would say to me, Pastor, I, have an ex- I, I need God to show up in my life. Do something dramatic. I, I want to see God just do something that will remind me. I need a Hallmark card from heaven, okay? Maybe not even a major miracle, just a little God wink. This will do it, okay? Start tithing. I'm so glad that as a new Christian, I was actually in a fighter pilot squadron in the United States Air Force, and these were all afterburner kind of people, you know, Top Gun, Goose, and Maverick. But these were, there were only two kind of people in the squadron. There were those with Jesus and those who were not with Jesus. And the ones that were with Jesus were all afterburner Christians. And in a single week, I went from laughing at those guys to being one of them. <laughs> and they taught me to pray on my own, taught me to read the Bible and feed myself the Word of God like vitamins every day, taught me to tithe, took me on a mission trip. I'm so grateful. They told me, when, if you want to be right with God and you want the financial blessing on your life, you give God 10% of everything that comes your way. And that includes that $100 check from Aunt Susie for Christmas. Ten bucks goes to a poor person. The peaches on your tree, the first bag, give them away. I've actually given away, we've given away lots of clothes. You have to, we've given away old cars rather than sell them. When it's time to change cars, I find somebody that just needs a car to get to work. I'm like, give them a car. It's great. It's fun. It's fun to watch them have a car and do well. You don't, you don't get that much money for an old car anyway. And if you give it away, you don't feel bad when it finally dies, right? Because it's probably going to. <laughs> Now, a guy one day, a man one day said to me, you can't claim that promise. You can't claim that promise because it's only given to Old Testament Jews. And I was dumbstruck, Lynn. I couldn't talk. That didn't happen very often, you know. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Because uh, I've, I've been claiming the promise for years and experiencing the blessing for years. What I should have said is, that may be right in some sense, it's promised to the Jews. But in 2 Corinthians 1.20, my Bible says, all the promises of God are yes and amen, which means it is so, in Christ. There's that prepositional phrase popping up again. In Christ, I can claim all the promises of God, and so I do. Now, people object to tithing. They say, oh my gosh, I cannot afford to tithe. You don't understand, Pastor. I'm broke at the end of the month. How can I tithe? I say, it's easy. You tithe at the first of the month, you'll still be broke at the end of the month. Nothing will change. (laughs) Except... your contentment level will be up. Your competence level in God's providing ability will be up, and you will begin to see, not necessarily that week, but over time, you sow first and you reap, you will see the hand and blessing of God upon your finances. If you say to me, I'm just not going to do it, I can't do it, I don't believe in it, don't like my church that much, don't trust the deacons, whatever, don't expect to see the blessing of God on your finances, okay? Because he will do exactly what he says he will do. I do believe this. I believe if you've never done it, try it. In fact, if you've never tithed to this church, and by the way, I think tithing, I believe in storehouse tithing. You know what that means? It's an old southern expression. I I am from Texas, by the way. You probably noticed my accent. It only shows when I open my mouth. (laughs) Storehouse tithing is where are you being fed spiritually? If you live on a ranch in Montana and all you have is a dish and you're, you're being fed by a TV preacher, maybe you give it that TV preacher. But if you're being fed here, this is your church home. This is your fellowship. This is the community that looks out for you and prays for you. Then I would give here predominantly, okay? I was going to make you an offer. If, you, if you've never been a tithe ever, why don't you try it for three months, uh, November, December, and January, and see if it doesn't bless your heart. And if, it, if you can come in after three months and say, this is just not working for me, Lynn Billings will give you a full refund of your tithe. 
I'm, I'm serious. And I've got your back. I'll refund you. I'm that confident that you will not come in in three months and say, I'm sorry I did this. You'll say, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Because you'll see the difference. Now, how many people here would say, I'm actually rich? If you're a rich person, raise your hand. Any rich people here? Did, did you sleep in a warm place last night? Did you have a bed and a door that locked? Did you drive a car? Did you have breakfast? Are you wearing good clothes? Get your hands up. <laughs> you know that one of every eight people in the world don't even have fresh water to drink. If you have a car, you're in the top one or two percent of the population of earth. Yeah, we, in biblical terms, we're all rich. So what if we looked at, in closing, let's look at the instructions to rich people. You're going to be surprised. Instructions to the rich. Oh, skip that. Go on. Oh, oh well, this is actually, back up. Say, I've got time. We'll get to the instructions. I, uh, somebody will always say to me, Pastor Jim, Jesus never taught tithing. I forgot I had a slide. Yes, he did. He taught tithing. He did it obliquely. Matthew 23, the, the chapter of seven woes to the Pharisees, says, Woe to you, Pharisees, you tithe mint and dill and cumin. You tithe a, a tenth of your spices. You take your 1,247 seeds, and you take a knife, and you spend an hour counting out the 1,247 seeds, and you give 124.7 of them to the synagogue. You do that. And you neglect the weight of your matters of the law, justice and mercy. These things you should have done. And then he throws a little... Brooklyn curve at him without neglecting the former. He actually commends them for tithing their seeds. Now, that's the New Testament. Also, the plan of God, I think, for your economy is Luke 6.38. Do you know Luke 6.38? I would put this on your mirror in your, where you see it every day if you don't. It is in a passage. The context here is mercy and forgiveness. And he says, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, they'll pour it in your lap. We're back to those seeds. When they tithed the seeds, they gave the tenth often to some poor person that didn't have any seed corn so they could plant and have a crop. And when, the, when you gave out seed corn to various poor people and then harvest time came, they'd bring you back from their harvest. You got your Pharisee robe on. How do they give you the seed? You hold your robe up like this and they pour it into your lap. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And it's running over. You can't even hold all that comes back. And that is God's plan. In fact, if you want a, a, a test, not only besides tithing, and you get a money back guarantee, 90 days. I'm serious about that. You want to pray a prayer that God will answer. You want to hear God answer on your prayer. Go home today and say, God, what have I got in my house that you'd like me to give away? Tell me who, prompt me. Put the face of the person I should give to. That bicycle I haven't ridden in a long time. That boat we haven't had in the water in three years. The treadmill that's taking up space. Get rid of that treadmill. <laughs> then you won't feel guilty about not getting on it. Uh, the too many clothes in your closet. Goodwill will take those clothes and do things with them, right? You bet. Yeah. Think of what God would have you give away just for the joy of giving it away. In fact, giving away a bunch of stuff feels like losing weight. It actually feels good, doesn't it? To downsize, to get rid of the... You know, it, one of the things that has annoyed me for years in our house, in 21 years, there were 10 houses on our block, and we were the only house on the block that could get two cars in our two-car garage. You ever notice that? Not to put guilt on you, but there's a neighbor of my new house that has a three-car garage, and all of his cars are on the driveway. You know, time to become a giver, dude. Offload some of this cargo. It'll feel like losing weight. Okay, where was I? Instructions to the rich. Let's go to there. First Timothy 6, my last thing. Command those who are rich, command those at First Baptist Church of Golden not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our... Can you do that? Can you handle that? Command them to be good, to be rich in good deeds. We haven't spent a penny yet, have we? And finally, he says, oh, by the way, do be generous and willing to share. Next slide. If we look at that in terms of the least, can you, can you not be arrogant... And don't put your hope in wealth because it disappears. Hope in God who provides. But do good. Be rich in good deed. And then be generous and be willing to share. Do those things, my friend. And money will be a great servant to you. And you will enjoy contentment no matter who wins the election, what happens to the country. The economy goes up, down. We end up in the hills being persecuted. We'll still be the remnant of the people of God who serve Him 
and money serves us, and it will make us very different than the people around us. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this morning's time and teaching, and your word speaks to me. Let it speak deep to us, Father, that we be more committed than ever before to serve you and let our money serve us. By the name and the glory and by the power of Jesus, everybody said amen and amen.